It's a, a true honor for me to be here talking to you today about uh, building and managing profitable content assets for an omni-channel world. How we do business today is very different than how we did business 20 years ago. And so I want to share a few things with you today that I think will help you uh, in your efforts for e-commerce. We're going to do a little bit of time travel today. First, uh, I'm going to take you back to the very first online transaction that ever happened. Um, and then we're going to fast forward a little bit to something that happened two years ago that caused me to sit back and realize that things and how we do business are going to be changing over the next 20 years and I'll, I'll explain what that is. And finally I'm going to share with you a framework that I've created for my clients to help them in um, the next 20 years of doing online business. So first though I want to, uh, by way of introduction, bring you back to 1992. And um, in 1992, it was the first time I was online. Anybody else back then online? Yay, there's a few of you. So for those of you who don't know, back in 1992, the internet was only available to academic institutions, to scientific institutions, and to government. And um, so for me, this is, this is me in 1992. I had just graduated, I know, great hair. It's really good hair. <laughs> um, I had just graduated from high school and was moving about eight hour drive away to my university for the first time. And so being that it was an academic institution, I had access to what we knew as the internet. But the problem was, is just like there was only a few of you here who were online back in 1992, there, you really had to know someone in order for the internet to be effective because the only thing we could really do back then was send emails uh, or use Telnet or interrelay chat, which is sort of the precursor to what we use for Skype and, and Messenger today. So lucky for me, I did know someone who happened to be both in a scientific institution and a government institution as well, and that was my dad. So it was really fantastic because I was driving eight hours away from home for the first time and he was still in my hometown. And so we actually spent a lot of time emailing back and forth every day. And the fantastic part about that is all of my friends were sending letters to their hometowns, to their parents, and they had to wait five or six days for the mail to arrive to get responses. Whereas my dad and I could actually email each other every day, at least four or five times a day if we really wanted to. And so now the internet had allowed us the ability to close the gap between our asynchronous communication channels. We were able to close the, the time barrier to how we communicated. And that was really fantastic. So that was in 1992. So over the next few years, a lot happened on the internet. We actually had web browsers, Amazon launched. And in 1994, we were able to take that communication one step further. And in 1994 was the very first online transaction that took place. And it was the actual purchase of a CD. And this isn't, um, you know, radio or any of the online streaming that we have today. It was even before Napster, I'm afraid. But in 1994, someone actually sold uh, Sting's Ten Summoner's Tale. It's his fourth studio album CD. And they sold it online, and the actual someone paid for it online. And of course, it was then distributed after that fact in the mail. And that, my friends, was the very first online transaction. That was the birth of what brings us to this conference today. And for those of you who are audiophiles in the room, um, this CD included uh, Fields of Gold and, um, and If I Ever Lose My Faith in You. So that really started the next boon of the internet um, with this kind of uh, this transaction. And it opened up a whole world beyond just asynchronous communication, but rather it provided us with the ability to sell online. It created a global marketplace for all of us to benefit from. And with that global marketplace comes all of the challenges, of course, with that. In the 2000 book, The Clue Train Manifesto, 
the, one of the first manifestos is that markets are conversations. So we went from an email conversation back and forth to a global audience conversation with all of the transactions that go along with that. We also have all the pain points. So we have multiple languages to deal with. We have multiple currencies to deal with. Um, but it also created a lot of opportunity. So this brings me to my first point about content. Because content is something that we often forget about in business. And it's something we often forget about even if we have an e-commerce website. I work with clients around the world and the last thing they always think about is their content. But it's interesting to me because it really should be one of the first things they think about. Because when it comes to content, when people come to a website to buy something, even if they're buying a product or a service, what they're actually buying are words, images, video, or audio. Any of the content that you're placing online to sell the product that you're selling. So even if you're selling, like I said, a shoe, it's the picture of the shoe or the words about the shoe that actually compel them to buy. So I argue, then, that content is actually a commodity. And it's a commodity that we often don't think about when it comes to e-commerce. And I'll take it one step further. If content, then, is a commodity, it's also a business's largest asset. And oftentimes, when I tell my clients that it's their biggest asset, they actually don't realize that it really is. They think of their human capital, they think of all of the things that go along with content being, uh, sorry, their human capital and all the things that go along with the, the business operations as being the content of their assets. But in terms of content asset, they often don't think about it. So what happened next on the internet? Well, there became this focus. Sure, people recognize content, but there became a focus on our customer. So we started looking at websites and we started thinking, how can we get customers to come to our websites? So the content that we create, sure, back a few years ago, we could use search engine optimization and search engine marketing. We could find out how we could build relationships and interact with people using social media. But it was all about building a better experience for our customers. It's always about bringing them to the table, bringing them to our websites. But something happened two years ago, and as a content strategist, it caused me to give pause and realize that things are changing. And what was that thing that happened? It was the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl, for those of you who don't know, is one of the largest sporting events in North America. American football. And in 2013, it was the Baltimore Ravens and the San Francisco 49ers. And it was played at the beginning of February. Now what happened in 2013? And the fact that I even paid attention to this is amazing because I don't really follow football. But what happened at that point was that it was sort of the, the start of the third uh, period or third quarter in the football. And something that had never happened before happened. Ha, huh, there we go. And the lights went out. Does anyone remember that event? Anybody? Few people from North America remember that event. So the lights went out, and the gameplay was suspended for 34 minutes. And now, if you know anything about the Super Bowl, there's something that happens concurrently with the Super Bowl that often people don't realize, but people like myself, marketers, people who are into content, uh, realize that so much so that on Twitter there's a hashtag called the brand bowl that goes on at the same time. And there's speculation on what advertising is going to be the most popular at that moment. Because you see, companies and brands pay almost uh, th $3 million, sorry, $4 million for a 30 second ad spot on CBS when the football game is being played. That's for one ad that is being run.
And so what happened when the lights went out on that fateful 2013 game was, sure, they were able to cut to commercial break, but something else happened that had never happened before. Social media took over, and this ad came out. And basically it said, power out, no problem. You can still dunk in the dark. Now, when I was preparing this presentation, I was worried that maybe you don't know what Oreo cookies are, and this was an Oreo cookie ad. But thanks to Google, I found out that the Czech Republic is actually where Oreo cookies are made for most of Europe and distributed. I also found out through YouTube that someone at the Oreo cookie company ran an advertisement where they actually took your beer out of your beer mugs, replaced it with milk to emphasize the point that you can still dunk cookies in beer mugs. I think that was a shame, really. Anyway, so this ad came out, and it was retweeted over 15,000 times. And the hashtag brand bowl suddenly went from people talking about commercials and television advertising, and they were talking about this tweet. And the next day, in all of the ad papers, this was what they were talking about. Now, why were they talking about it? Sure, it was creative. Sure, it broke through the mainstream media with a simple tweet, but something else happened that I really thought was very cool, having been online for so long. Because when you work with companies, you'll realize that in order for this tweet to go out, in order to give up control and provide that creative freedom to be able to be nimble and responsive to the market conditions that are in front of you, is virtually impossible especially when it comes to content. And in medium-sized to larger organizations, the amount of approvals, the amount of project managing in order to create content is astronomical. So for me, this was a huge coup by the creative types for getting their content out so quickly to have such a profound effect. And when we think of omni-channels today, that's the kind of company that we need to run, and that's the kind of company we need to be. We have to become agile enough as a company to be able to respond quickly to the various market conditions that are out there. So when you think about commercials or advertising, or even the content you create for marketing collateral offline, and probably you've picked up some of these habits when you're creating content for online as well. We think of content as a product. We think of it as an output. And we don't think of content as a line item in our budgets. We think of it as something that we take, the con we take our money, we put a budget towards it, and we create content, which allows for a very linear process that doesn't have much room for being responsive. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. This goes far, far back. Oh, that's cool, someone loves Oreo cookies. Nice. Um, oh, and do I like Czech beer? I haven't tried it yet. Um, let's go back to Mo Mozart. So if we go back to something that is familiar in terms of content as product, we've been doing this for years and years and years. In the 1700s, Mozart, who loved Prague. In fact, when he moved to Prague, he said it was the happiest day of his life. And I'll tell you why. Because when Mozart was composing his symphonies in Salzburg, Austria, he, the Austrians didn't understand his music. They didn't appreciate the kind of music he was creating. Um, and so it was frustrating for him. When he created The Marriage of Figaro, he came to Prague for the first time, and he played it. And the Bohemian people loved his music, and they couldn't believe, they, they understood and they appreciated it, and he was appreciated more than when he was at home. And that's why when he did move to Prague, it became the happiest day of his life, because the people of the Czech Republic appreciated his, his content. So this really rich impresario heard the marriage of Figaro, and came up to him and said, I'm going to commission you to create a piece. So it's sort of like a boss coming to you and saying, I need some content. So Mozart went back to Salzburg, created a piece of music, brought it back to the Czech Republic, or uh, 
or the Prague, where it was at the time, Bohemia, and played this piece of music to resounding success. Content as product. He was commissioned to make some content, went back home, created the content, brought it back to Prague, where we now know that piece of music as Don Giovanni. That is content as product. But with the Oreo cookie ad, that signified a change. That's content as process. Okay, it's no longer a linear output. Now it's about outcomes in relation to the market conditions. It's about being nimble enough within an organization to be able to respond regardless of what channel presents itself. So as I was talking about earlier, we've spent 20 years since the first Sting album was sold, we've spent 20 years talking about the customer and talking about our users. And what we haven't really done is looked at ourselves. We haven't looked at ourselves as companies. We've created companies based on industrial revolution models that define content as product. And we haven't really thought about us. We haven't looked in the mirror. And by the way, for those of you who are in marketing and think of customers, at least in English, there's the word us in customer as well. And so as businesses, we have to start looking at us in order to be profitable over the coming 20 years and in order to start looking at all of the channel experiences in front of us. Because what's happening in a lot of companies when I talk about these industrial revolution models is that, this is from an altimeter report, um, our content is fractured. This is in larger organizations, but it also happens in small organizations. I worked for a dot com in Los Angeles and it was incredibly fractured how they were creating their content. Because corporate communications has a piece of it, marketing has a piece of it, um, the website of course has some content, customer service is dealing with content, and we're missing a way of being able to respond when we have an organizational structure that is not structured conducively to how content needs to be reactive within the 24-7 marketplace that we're now created and that we're now working with. I, I don't know if any of you caught it, but on the Shop Expo website, I asked them to add to my profile that I'm an amateur chef. What does that mean? I don't know, I just like to cook. But I put it there as an Easter egg, you know, something that you could sort of think about um, and find that relates to my talk. I'm a really, I love cooking, but I also love reading about cooking and reading about celebrity chefs. And when I looked at this report, Altimeter report, but again, this could be any one of my clients, it could be exactly the same. I was reading a book at the time by Anthony Bourdain called Kitchen Confidential. And if anyone's worked in the restaurant industry, it, it really summarizes what it is like when you're working in a restaurant. Because in a restaurant, the kitchen has to remain nimble to the demands of what's going on in the front of the house. So I'm just gonna walk over here so I can read this. So Anthony Bourdain said, line cooking done well is a beautiful thing to watch. It's a high speed collaboration resembling ballet or modern jazz. A properly organized line cook, one who works clean and has moves, meaning economy of movement, nice technique and speed, can perform his duties with Nijinsky-like grace. And I thought, wow, if only we as organizations who create content, because by the way, you may be selling a product or a service being an e-commerce company, but I always tell my clients, if you have a social media channel, if you have a web channel, if you have an offline channel for any marketing, you are also a publishing company first. 
You're publishing content all the time. And so the best thing to do is to have a structure within the organization that allows you to move with Nijinsky-like grace allows you to move like in a restaurant, being able to adapt to the market conditions. Because if, if you're sitting in a restaurant at the front of the house, you don't realize what's going on at the back of the house. And at the back of the house where the food preparation is going on, food is sent back, there are changes to orders, and they have to be able to keep up all the time with those demands. So what I've come up with is a model to help my clients with this new reality, with all of these different channels and all of the channels that will present themselves over the next 20 years. And I call it the stretch model. And I, I recently applied this model to my work with Canada's central bank, the Bank of Canada, um, but also with smaller organizations as well. And so what the stretch model is, is it's an acronym. Oftentimes, when we're talking about content, we think about social media tactics. We think of content marketing. We think of, you know, the website. We think of search engine marketing. All of those things are tactics. And the problem with those tactics is if we're not organized ourselves as an organization properly, those tactics will only succeed over the short term. Inevitably, they'll fail in some capacity because we're going to be stuck scrambling as a company to be able to continue to produce the demands of the content that is required of us through these channels. So this cube model shows you that the tactics are part of what we do as a content publishing company, but there are certain parts of that cube that are required as pillars of the companies that we operate. So we have to look at our structure of how the company is organized, the time it takes to create content, the routines or workflows that we have in place within the company, the engagement that we have amongst our employees to build a corporate culture of uh, publishing, the talent that we have in-house to properly create content, the culture, as I said, the corporate culture around publishing model, and hierarchy. So how engaged is all levels of our hierarchy right from the CEO down to be able to believing that content is truly our business asset. It's our main and primary business asset when we are managing all of these different channels and being able to be responsive to the market demands that are available to us in an instant, just like Oreo Cookie did. I want to share with you a little story. A few years ago, I was at a conference for mobile app developers. And the mobile app developers for Sears were at the conference. Sears is a very large department store in North America. And it is sort of like the precursor to e-commerce in that its primary method of distribution of sales back a long time ago, and even today, was catalog sales, which I hear are making a comeback. So they created catalogs that they would send out to remote and rural areas where people could buy furniture online, they could buy clothing, on, or not online, but furniture and clothing from these catalogs and it allowed for people to access products more effectively in their hometowns and then it would get shipped to them after the fact. So really Sears was a publishing company, not an e-publishing company, but certainly a publishing company a long time ago. So fast forward to a few years ago and they created a mobile app that allowed for people to buy their products through this mobile app. And this company did their research, they did their user research to find out uh, what needed to be done in order for this app to be effective. What they didn't anticipate was when they launched the app, the very first purchase that would come through. They thought it would be clothing or socks or something fairly innocuous. And instead, it was a rotting lawnmower. That's a pretty large thing to buy 
through a small mobile device. So they actually tracked down the, purchase who, the man who purchased the, the riding lawnmower and said, hey, you know, we've done all our user research and I don't understand how uh, you bought a riding lawnmower through our mobile app. And, they, and the, the man said, well, I was in your store and your customer service people were really busy at the time and I really wanted to buy this particular lawnmower that happened to be on sale. So I was on my phone and I purchased it and I left the store and I figured I'd come and pick it up later when it was ready to be picked up, saving me time. So you see, content is now changing and evolving and becoming the primary part not only of publishing but of customer service and customer experience. And that is where we're moving in the next 20 years. And in order to do that, in order to be able to provide that level of customer service and think of all of the uses of our various channels and be able to fund them with the content that we create, in order to do that, we have to start thinking differently about how we organize our own companies and how we organize and think about ourselves. I really like this quote um, that came about in the Harvard Business Review. As CEOs plan their strategies to take advantage of transformational shifts, they are also assessing their current capabilities and finding that everything is fair game for reinvention. Everything is fair game for reinvention. We started out with email back in 1992. We've moved through the next phases of e-commerce. And where are the next 10 years going to take us? And is your company ready? to be nimble to those changes. I want to encourage you, if you are interested, to find out if you are ready for those changes. My workshop tomorrow, I've created a workbook um, that allows you to evaluate how your company is doing in terms of the responsiveness to these sort of changes that are coming about, and allows you to target right away the areas that you can use to, um, to, to improve the business that you have already. So I encourage you to take that. And uh, I wanted to thank you so much for, um, for the, the opportunity today to speak. So, thank you. So, Christina Mauser, thank you very much. Thank you. What a beautiful presentation. Um, and somebody just wrote out that he loved the black and white feeling of your presentation. What a good idea for e-commerce conference. <laughs> so, we have some questions. What do you think is the future of online content? Well, I think online content is going to move towards that service approach I was talking about, being responsive to um, the service demands that we have. I think we're going to move away from just the marketing angle of content, but also the service angle and the customer experience angle of content. Thank you. Uh, who is good in content globally? I mean, probably from marketing perspective for big companies, what do you think? Who is good in it? Sorry, what's the marketing? Who is good in content globally? That was the question. Who's good at content? It just disappeared, but it was the question. Ah, good at content. If we have any examples, for example, You know who's some... great at content? It's funny, MailChimp was here. Content, they do great content. <laughs> they actually do. They do? Content. They do, very what good What sort content. of content they, 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 they do? What sort of content? Yeah. In terms of customer service content, if you've ever gone to their uh, website. I'm using they, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they actually have a whole library of okay. ways to construct content, and, uh, and they uh, have uh, really, really, they have good content strategies there that are working on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think it is better to know one part of that construction well, or to know all of them enough to get them? It's probably something with your presentation. I, I didn't get it, but. <laughs> The stretch model. Oh, which part is better to do one part of them? Um, you know what, the, the stretch model, all parts have to be in place in order for it to work. So if one part fails, it, it, there's going to be pickup on other parts. Um, and the model is meant to kind of, uh, to, be, to evolve. So it's a little tipsy if you don't have all of those in place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something about Oreo. So what was the Oreo and milk, the motivation for you to make black and white presentations? No, I just like black and white presentations. <laughs> and probably the last one. I have seen your tweet from Prague. Did you like it there? 
Prague is a beautiful city, and I you went. You did some ride in some red car, didn't you? I did. I did some riding in a red car. Yeah. That's right, and it was really fun. And um, I went to the Charles Bridge, and I specifically looked up the statue that you have to rub in order to be able to come back to Prague or to be inspired to come back. So I rubbed it in the hopes that I'll be back in the Czech Republic soon. But what we are supposed to say here is. I loved Prague, but then I came to Ostrava and, and it, I was really fascinated. I was blown away. Blown away. I love yeah. the gong. <laughs> Christina Mauser, thank you very much.